Okay, there could be a discrepancy in terms of numbers. Why one watch influencer has 5,000 followers and the other ones have 100,000 and got the little K next to the number? Well, truth is, we need to go back to the original definition of how do you define influence and what does it mean to be an influencer? And I'm gonna give the first mic to Jessica um, in responding to this question, because this is not the right or wrong answer, but it's just interesting to, pay, to pose the basis of the definition. In, in my eyes, I see influence as not necessarily a number, but influence as to whether you have influence over your friends or you have influence in your community and you're looked at as a figure of knowledge and enthusiasm and passion and whether you have one person listening to you or a million, it's those people trust what you're saying and trust your passion and your value and then they follow suit. Austin, you probably have the biggest account of all of us, probably all of our numbers combined. Um. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's a good thing. I, mean, um, I would say that influence, it would depend if the account is obviously personal or if it's, you know, a company run by an organization. But I would say if it's a personal account, obviously, just uh, echoing what Jessica was talking about, you, you need to be influencing people in terms of trust and in terms of people uh, looking to you as like a guide into the space of watches, kind of. Um, however, when it comes to biases and all this type of stuff, I think the nature of this industry um, is built around emotion, passion, storytelling, and sharing. And inherently, if you have a personal account, I don't think it's actually possible to be unbiased because the nature of the space is fueled by emotion, passion, and storytelling. However, I think there could be a different case to be made with organizations that have watch accounts. Um, but I do think influence is, uh, you know, there's, n n it's not more important to have more followers or less followers. Like, that's not what it's about. It's about the community that you impact around you. And that's, at the end of the day, what, what it's about. Ashari is the second oldest person on the stage after me, and yet someone of uh, immeasurable influence, certainly in my eyes. What is your perception of influence, sir? Uh, first of all, uh, Wei and uh, Revolution, thank you very much for including me in this very, very esteemed panel. As I just said in the beginning, I'm not really sure how I ended up here, but here I am. Um, I think for me, influencing is a very interesting word because it has many manifestations. Uh, for me personally, influencing has a lot to do with inspiration and aspiration. And I think that's my take back from social media, and that's how I look at uh, people I feel have influenced me via social media or vice versa. I think it's about taking something back and trying to maybe mold it in your own way and sort of putting it forward uh, to a wider audience. And that's the power of social media today is the outreach is so large that you can easily influence. But you know, as I said, it has many, many, many manifestations. The word, do not confuse it with sort of just you know advertising, which is very different to influencing. So you know, that's that's how I look at the whole concept of influencing. May I ask the question to Dylan as well? Dylan, uh, so Shari, you, what you do, and I know uh, Jessica, and probably Austin, as I know you guys very well, is an extension of how you live your lives, and, and it's kind of very natural and organic. But to some degree, influencing also is the creation of a universe, one that the audience finds compelling. Where do you draw the line between what is uh, correct influencing and what is uh, incorrect influencing, if you draw a line at all? So I think the most important thing is to be authentic. Um, we see people posting things today that they truly don't believe in. Uh, like Ashari said, advertising. Um, so if you have a clear vision of what you like uh, and understand that, it's easier to translate that into your social networks. I mean, influencing doesn't necessarily have to be socially on social media, but it can be socially amongst your friends and, and family. But if you keep your level of authenticate, like authentic uh, with yourself, then it's much easier for you to transmit that across your peers. Yeah, I think the personal thing is extremely important. You know, um, uh, Andrea Casaleño, uh, 
I, I, you're like the one man ambassador for the Execo soft watch. You know, I think I think you like, like if it was a stock, you if, like if you got sick or whatever like that, or when you had their injury, they would have been trembling. They're like, fuck, you know. But 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 tell me because you wrote a great article with Cam Wolf from GQ, and for you it was so important to identify like watches that are gateway drugs, like right for that are, are, are a younger person could have access to that they might want a cardiac crash, but that's not an easy watch to get, for example. But you've identified this, and it's a reflection of you. Tell me about how yes. that is. First, thank you for having me, and uh, well. Well, thanks for mentioning the article. I mean, uh, this watch, I think, really uh, helped me in what we called influencing right before because uh, I was, uh, the, the story is pretty fun. I was drunk, uh, which we all can relate to, and I bought it on eBay, <laughs> basically. I bought one because I was looking not for the, for the, for the cartridge crash, but for another affordable version, which was the um, Dunhill, I guess, or, or Churchill, I don't remember. Uh, yet I found this one and it was, it was pretty nice. And uh, afterwards, I realized when I got it in my hands that it's exactly what you said. It's something that we can have fun with. And I think that's super important because it's not just about how affordable something is. It's also about the fact that, uh, in my eyes, owning a crash was always such a responsibility somehow. Like, you're part of a club, you're part of a circle. And uh, this is, is a watch that everyone began buying afterwards. A lot of people posted. And, uh, to me, the key point is that it makes us have a lot of fun and takes away this kind of sacrality somehow of, of watchmaking, uh, which I think is, is, is what we need as young people. And, and yet, yeah, it's, it's affordable. And also, it's something that is not a copy of anything. It has a personality, it has a character. So it's an alternative, but it's a valid alternative, just more affordable and still. It was influencing pretty much, so I'm very happy about it. Dude, you made it a thing. Like everyone wants that watch yeah. now. I mean, it's impressive. You should have told us <laughs> beforehand, Andre. You know, <laughs> you know it happened already, but uh, excellent. Um, Asher, uh, you, first of all, dude. Uh, uh, Asher and I went to the same high school, if you can believe it or not. Like, 65 years apart, but okay, nonetheless. One guess who was cooler. Uh, it certainly was Asher. <laughs> um, but, so you have created Collective Horology, and this is a community, but centered around limited editions, right? Which are, have now become a business for you. And I get asked this question all the time, so I want to know your answer. How do you manage a commercial business successfully, yet keep the integrity of creating really cool editions and expanding your community? Uh, when you figure it out, let me know. Um, but uh, no, in, in all seriousness, when my partner and I started this business, you know, we, we, we are not watchmakers, we are not watch designers. We are watch lovers and we came to this from the perspective of where we started this business, which was as uh, marketing and advertising people. And um, you know, I went to school for theater. I'm a storyteller. That's what I like doing. And I believe that watches are an incredible canvas for storytelling. So if you look at it in that perspective and you think about every release that that we've done and that we aspire to release in the future, we try to have every watch tell a distinct story. And that's a different perspective than, I think, um, approaching it from a more cynical perspective of saying, well, if we just went for a watch or a reference that everybody likes and we shrink it and pink it, or we do something to it that just adjusts it and you know, makes it commercially viable, um, just never appealed to us. So that means that we take a lot of risk because we follow our own passion for platforms that we think have something to tell and um, a story that's, that's worth conveying on that platform. And if you do it that way, I think you attract people who get excited about that kind of storytelling, who are curious and who are open-minded and they view collaboration as a way of exploring and finding something new instead of just getting something that um, is rare or limited. Um, so avoiding cynicism, I think, is, is thoroughly critical. Amazing, thank you very much. So looking at all these conversation, obviously we can discuss for hours on so many things, but Back to the influencers, there's been some difference in terms of covering what the industry is all about. And when you look at accounts like I Fucking Love Watches or The Wrong Wrist, they've become key players in the industry, and yet we have no idea who they are. Uh, wrong Wrist is Omar. No, but I, I know uh, that, but not everybody knows that in a sense that we were talking about how people are impersonating their account. They are not for specific reasons, and yet they have a genuine voice. How do you feel when you decided to went into the influence sphere to go either against it or work around it? Dylan, please. So firstly, I didn't think I wanted to get into an influencer sphere. Um, it, was, it was an account for myself. Um, I was traveling, I was having a great time as a young 20-year-old 
uh, and I just like to kind of showcase my lifestyle at that point in my you know my journey. Um, that included some watches at the time. Um, I always had a passion for watches growing up, and it was kind of inevitable that. Uh, with the rise of Instagram and the accounts that you followed, it was something that you also wanted to take part in. So slowly I started to post on my, my Instagram. And I think today I'm also not a typical watch influencer. Um, I post what I like. I, I post my clothes. I post the places I eat at. And it's myself. You know, you see who I am. You see my face. And most accounts today, you don't see that. It's a, a man and a camera and his wrist. You don't see anything beyond that into his lifestyle. So my account is very much lifestyle driven and not watch driven, um, but that also has its challenges. Uh, I think we'll come onto that in the future. Um, and another question, but uh, coming back to, to your question, um, yeah, be authentic, stick to what you know best and things move forward. Thank you very much. Um, now, if I move to you, Austin, you do have two accounts that are pretty popular, and one is more personal, the other one is more professional. How do you decide where goes what? Yeah, it's um, a great question. Uh, when I started Horror Loop, it was kind of an accident. Um, I started it out of desperation and loneliness because when I messaged all the big accounts with my personal account, Austin Choo Choo, at the time, everyone would ignore me. <laughs> Not a single person replied, and I thought, huh, maybe I should create an anonymous account, not post my face, not post my name, not say where I'm from, and maybe watch accounts will reply to me. That was kind of the origins of Horror Loop. And um, yeah, I was just going into watch boutiques, taking photos of watches, and just sharing my thoughts. Um, I think if you look at my page and you scroll to the first photo that, I, photo that I've ever posted and look at my feed now, it's there has obviously been a lot of evolution, but it's still relatively consistent, right? Like the theme. And so um, for myself in Horror Loop, uh, the reason why I haven't been posting much this year is because I still have the principle of every photo on the page, I have to be the photographer. And I have never posted a photo on Horror Loop that was a watch photo that I didn't take myself. Um, and that's partly why I haven't been posting that often because I've been busy with wrist check, which I'll go on to now. Um, and with Horror Loop, obviously, it's my own personal thoughts. It's what I like. I don't post what I don't like. I post what I like. I share my thoughts. I don't, you know, it's just me um, and my lifestyle. I mostly post via stories now. Whereas with Wrist Check, it's, you know, it's a business. We're um, a watch platform where we're uh, completely transparent with buyers and sellers. Buyers know exactly what sellers net. Sellers know what buyers pay. Um, and we also have working relationships with uh, multiple brands on that. And with Wrist Check, the aim really is to educate to create communities and to create a safe space for people to buy and sell. And so everything that we're doing with Risk Check is really moving along those few pillars. And the great thing is we have a team of over 50 people now that you know are dedicated to that and they're all watch lovers. And so when you get the opinions of 50 watch lovers, obviously the result of that will be much more unbiased than a personal account such as mine. And so, yeah. Thank you. I guess my next question before I hand it over to you is to Sherry. Because, to, don't worry, there's no trick in my question. <laughs> um, you, were, I mean, you are a watch collector and you ended up joining this watch family as basically a key person of that industry, kind of, as we call it, serendipity. You were not asking for it, you were not looking for it, and yet you'd, you're part of it. But your role as an influencer is very different from everybody else. So how do you see that I guess in the future, and how you, do you think differently now in the way you post and communicate about watches? Actually, no, I don't really. I mean, I think, you know, I would say I post less these days because I think laziness and workloads sort of takes, it, takes over, doesn't it? But, um, but actually, no, I, I've always been focused on posting on what I like, or rather what watches I like, and uh, I've, I've continued to do that. Um, whether or not that influences is, again, for me, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a brave new world, and it's something that I'm also sort of uh, living and learning as I go through it. I'm, I'm not, you know, um, and I think, again, for me, it started completely, as, as Austin just mentioned, I, for me, it also started completely by chance. Uh, it was a way for me to channel 
my love for watches uh, by being able to express it, in this case, uh, by the media of pictures. And again, I, I, like, I just take my own pictures using an iPhone. I don't like, you know. And um, it just sort of worked like that, really. So, you know, it was, it's not, uh, it's not, it was never really very well thought out or mapped out. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to now segue into the highly flattering but extremely controversial section of our, our question asking, <clears throat> Jessica Joe. So, uh, like for me, I, I have to really admire it when people uh, bring something new to the conversation, right? Uh, and I think that's the way in which brands, like you compel them to include you because you're bringing something, a voice that, that is unique and singular and that no one else has. And so there's four individuals, two of which are here today, that have really come to represent an all-new voice in watch communication. Um, one is uh, Malika Crawford from Hodinkee. The other is um, Bryn Walner from Dime Piece. Uh, Trang from uh, Girls O'Clock and yourself, Jessica. Um, and what's interesting to me is that, and this is a controversial bit, the, in the generation previous to this, um, when, when female journalists were entering into the watch industry, it was always about trying to establish equality. It was about, I know as much about men technically, right? Uh, or whatever, right? Um, and probably many of them do. But in, when you guys approached watch journalism, you did it by having fun and embracing who you are and talking about uh, the jewelry and fashion and you know, going out and, and being friends and all of those things that are wonderfully feminine. I mean, was that intentional or was that just, was that a strategy? Because if it was, it was brilliant. Tell us about that. I mean, I can't speak for Malika, Brennan, Trang um, at all, but I think that the nature of this industry being very male dominated, you flock to other females and especially the other young women. I think it was not even a strategy in any way. We wanted to support each other and at the beginning with Malika Brynn and I, we were all in different lanes and we were, were, I mean, everyone was different so it really worked for our benefit to support each other and we're genuine friends at the end of the day. I mean, the three people you listed are some of my closest friends outside of the watch industry. So it wasn't necessarily any strategy. I think it happened really organically, which is why we're all friends at the end of the day. But I think that you find that not just with women in this industry, but with anybody you flock to, you're bound to support them. And I think that th such a benefit and such a joy and the strength of this industry is you support your friends and you want to be around who you like. And you see that on all of our pages is, we really are champions for each other. And I think that's what makes this kind of new era of the industry so important is all of us want each other to succeed. There's not necessarily the competitive nature that it was in the same way, shape, or form. And I think Instagram has allowed that to happen. Yeah, I think the, the Instagram is a meritocracy is very interesting as well. So uh, Austin, I cannot exclude you from the controversy as well. Uh, so mainland China is probably always the number one or number two watch market in the world and has been for quite some time. But there is a perception by a lot of the world of what a mainland Chinese watch customer is like and how they behave and what they look like and how they speak and so on like that. I think you did an immense job to change that perception. You are mainland Chinese. You are incredibly well educated. You are trilingual because I think you speak Shanghainese as well as obviously Mandarin and English. How important, and, and in addition to that, also helped to create Audemars Piguet's Royal Perpetual Calendar China edition as well and are an AP ambassador. How important was it for you to change that perception? I thought it was extremely important. I mean, it's, it, it was so important that it almost became like part of my mission in the sense where growing up in China, obviously I saw Shanghai change in front of my eyes, right? Uh, the street I grew up on used to sell vegetables and fruit. And now it's like, uh, you know, luxury fashion stores and fine dining restaurants. And that all happened in such a short amount of time. And alongside that, the, the tastes and demands of the Chinese consumer also changed in the same, same pace, at the same pace almost. Um, in the past, it used to be all about, you know, gold watches, dress watches, all of that type, precious metal, needed to be as heavy as possible. They love diamonds, all that type of stuff. But a lot of that is shifting away now with the next generation. A lot of that is the influence of pop culture, the influence of celebrities. Um, and social media accounts as well um, in China. But I do think that Chinese consumers don't get respected enough um, in general uh, by watch brands. Um, you just look at the limited editions that have been done for the Chinese market versus markets that are just as big and look at the, type, the effort that goes into it, right? Most brands just do a Zodiac for Chinese New Year and that's it. 
that's been done for decades already, right? Um, there's a lot more that they can explore. There's China has 5,000 years of history. There's so much crap. There's lacquering. There's enameling. There's porcelain. There's jade. There's engraving. There's so micro paintings. There's a lot of stuff that China can offer silk. Um, but for some reason, a lot of that isn't really, uh, you know, it's not really considered when doing a limited edition for the region. And I do think that there should be more of a two way dialogue between consumers in China and the brands in Switzerland and HQ. Because right now I think the dialogue is still very one way. Um, but you know, it's, it's changing for the better, but not as fast as I would like. Excellent, thank you so much. Let the controversy continue. Now I wanna talk about general subject, but uh, Shari, I'm gonna ask you this question first, but I would like all of you guys to, to chime in if you feel you would like to, and that's the social media haters, right? So for a large uh, part of my life, I uh, entered social media much later because I, for the majority of the time that it was created, I didn't even know it existed because I'm really old. And I was unscathed by social media hate until just recently when I launched a collaboration with William Messina and even though the guy who owns the PS Unique that, ha wa that was our very first customer, the watch that was modeled on, people just lost their minds, right? It's so much so that actually the person that kind of like started the whole thing, like he and I were actually quite oblivious to this and it was, became a beast of its own. I mean, the end result was the watch out sold out really fast, so thank you haters. But, but, the, but my question to you, Shari, is because we had to think about should we you know, respond, should we leave the comments on in the end? We're like, let people say what they want because the market will decide, right? Um, I know that you had a bit of a controversy within the last year or so as well. And you're the nicest and most sincere person that I know of who has exquisite taste in watches. How did you deal with that? Well, like, <coughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a very good question because it's something that happens much more often these days and you do see it uh, on social media. Uh, for me, personally speaking, it just doesn't, I, you know, it doesn't get to me in any way or form. It doesn't really bother me because uh, for me, it's always been about uh, the hobby and about having fun with it and uh, doing what I like. And um, so as long as it doesn't bother me, it's, it's perfectly fine. I don't need to get involved. And, you know, by nature, I'm not very confrontational anyway. So, you know, it, it, it ties in very well with me. So that's how I deal with it. And, it seemed to have um, worked for me, or has been working for me. Your Zen Buddhist-like tranquility is admirable, sir. It was funny because I was having this conversation with Jean Arnaud this morning, and he said, it's kind of funny because our entire reason for existing in this industry is just to create things to make people happy. And yet, so much of the time, people are so unhappy. You know? That's, that's so, the whole thing, I, yeah. and that's what I feel right. as. Um, um, as much as social media has brought in a lot of uh, interesting um, aspects to the watch community, to the watch family, it's also brought in its fair share of downsides. Yes. Now, that was always there. there was al it was always lurking in the background. And I use the word lurking for that reason, but in the last 12 months or so, or maybe even longer, I can see that there's much more of it uh, coming out. And I don't know whether it's just people being frustrated or, you know, um, they genuinely want to get a message across. But that's, that's again, one of those manifestations of social media, which is quite, can be quite disruptive, but it is a very disruptive um, technology, so as to speak. And it's there to, um, what do you call it, um, create debate, create opinions, and more importantly, um, you know, create perceptions. So combining all of these uh, areas can get very tricky sometimes. And it affects different people differently because people, all, everyone is unique to themselves and they think differently. Andre, I'm gonna pose that same question to you, sir. Let me know what you think. You know, uh, I was thinking when you, when you were mentioning uh, what happened to you and I think it could have been easier maybe to deal with it because it was more maybe hate even towards a project or a watch that you feel like it's yours and it is yours, but it's not about you. Luckily, I don't get that much hate uh, for the moment. Maybe I hope uh, I will get more. I don't know. Um, usually, I just deal with the fact that uh, basically, it's it's it. I, I'm really lucky to be able to 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 speak and to have someone hearing. And at least hating is a feedback. And if the hate is about this towards yourself, not towards your, your what you do on your work, well, 
in the end, uh, well, who cares? <laughs> I, I, that's that's pretty much the game for me. But uh, uh, you know, most of the times it says, "Oh, you're short," or "Oh, you're fat," and that's true. So uh, what can I say? I mean, I, I love the pictures of you in your bathing trunks. I thought they were fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. you, you I lost like 50 followers to that picture. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason for it. But I love it because you just don't give a fuck. You know? Thank and, you. And yeah. everyone should just like, you know, uh, uh, appreciate that, right? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, oh, Asher, you know, how does it feel? I mean, in general, your watches are all sell out super fast, right? But how does it feel when someone criticizes it? I think there's, there's two things in there. Um, my, uh, my dad, uh, uh, paragon of, of uh, quotable phrases once told me that the opposite of, of love is not hate, it's indifference. And um, I think one thing I always try to keep in mind when we create something uh, new is uh, whether somebody loves it or they hates it, it's still an emotional reaction to it. And something that's polarizing isn't necessarily a bad thing. And I'd far prefer to see a lot of discourse or discussion about something that I did or that uh, Gabe and I made with a partner then it land with a thud and nobody say anything. So, uh, you know, nobody likes to get a negative reaction to something that they launch. I mean, especially something that you care about, like that stinks. But at the same time, it, you know, we all put ourselves out there. And I think this idea that if we're gonna put ourselves out there that everybody always has to be nice to us is probably a little unrealistic. So I think, I think that's part of it. The flip side of that, and this is, this is a thing that I try to remind myself about, and, and I, I think of a, a moment that happened to a friend of mine at a profile um, on Hodinkee and, and received a lot of personal ad hominem attacks for something. No, it was not Adam Levine. Not a friend of mine, but that'd be cool. Um, but uh, the, the reason I bring this up is people were genuinely cruel to him as an individual. And the one thing that I, I do try to remind myself, especially when I have a strong reaction to something, whether it's about a watch or something more, you know, more socially relevant or whatever, um, is a, just a reminder that like, that's a person, there's a person there, you know, and, and maybe I don't like what they did or I don't like their opinion or whatever, but that doesn't mean that I have to attack them. That, do, that, that, that doesn't mean that I can't say that I have a, you know, I can't critique something, I can't have an opinion, that's fine. But like the personal attack, I think is something uh, side that we have to be aware of. But, but that said, you know, if you're out there, it's gonna happen. And uh, accepting it is certainly better than not getting any reaction at all. It means that you exist. Yeah. Thank you, sir. I want to transition from the uh, personal social media attacks to potential physical attacks. Dylan, you spent a lot of time in London, right? Now, all of us, uh, dude, dude. And no, it's crazy because I just had a friend, like, literally message me yesterday, get off the train in St. Pancras, uh, and he got jacked for his, like, uh, uh, watches, like, like, one minute after he got off the, the train, you know? So my question for you is this, you know, we, uh, as social media people, we're always talking about, you know, this wonderful um, uh, metaverse where we walk around with watches, uh, beautiful watches, and no one will ever disturb us. But the reality is quite the different. It's quite different in London, for example, in Paris, most of the European capitals, I would say today, actually to some degree New York City as well, or a lot of the American cities as well, it's super dangerous to be walking around with a watch. Do you feel that danger, and do you feel it's still responsible to send that message out um, during a time where it's just so damn dangerous. You're right. Uh, the reality is very different from what you see on social media. Um, we all seemingly live a, a wonderful life um, on social media, and we always put the best out there. In reality, it's, it's quite different. Um, I struggle to get around the fact that we spend so much time investing into a hobby to buy certain things for ourselves that should technically bring us so much pleasure but in reality, it brings us, oh, in your, your, like in your friend's case, a lot of pain. Um, when I'm in London, I tend to not wear a watch, and that's the harsh reality of it. I, if I do have to wear a watch, it's something that is not precious uh, in terms of metals, um, not with a steel or a sports watch, uh, something very slim that I can fit under a shirt uh, or, a, or a cuff, um, and if I have to go to a meeting for a specific reason, I keep the watch in my pocket, uh, I get into an Uber, and once I get to the place, I take the watch off, um, finish my meeting, put it back into my pocket, and then get into another Uber. And uh, These are just the precautions that we have to take, uh, and to be honest, this is all fueled by social media. Um, what we have seen in the last 10 years is that people associate watches with value. 
not necessarily intrinsic value, but monetary value. So if you're buying a Daytona, you know, that may have been given to you by your grandfather as a gift, but in reality, people are just seeing dollar signs. So it's become an issue because I guess people can steal these watches, um, turn them really quickly for, for a small lump of money, but they don't realize the, the detriment that you will have in, you know, in long term. Uh, I've personally not, luckily, I've personally not been attacked for my watches, but I do know a lot of people that have. Um, and we just need to be a little bit more cautious, a little bit more responsible in what we showcase, because, you know, like we just said, uh, not everybody is a good person. Um, people have, you know, wants and needs, and if this is an easier way of getting money than the, the typical ways of going and getting a job, uh, then people will do that because it's the easy way out for a lot of people. Um, so, I, I, yeah, this is a message to, to everybody that lives in uh, pretty much anywhere in the world except Singapore and Dubai. Um, be and, mindful. And, and Hong Kong, sorry. And, and Hong Kong. Um, be mindful of the fact that, you know, people might be looking what's on your wrist. Um, take precautions. Be wary. Look over your shoulder two, three, four times because most of the time it's not like they'll ask you for your watch. They will hit you over the head, they'll stab you, and then they'll take your watch, um, which is unfortunately the, the very harsh reality. But don't you feel, I mean, I want to jump in because that's a conversation I've had many times, and I'm sure many of you in many dinners have the occasion to talk about it, but don't you feel that this only relates to the big four? Patek, RM, AP, Rolex. If you're wearing a Bulgari, if you're wearing a Frolland Mary, if you're wearing even a Philippe Dufour, you probably get a, you probably get attacked if you're unlucky because they know and they've done the homework, but it's not the generality. And I feel that in spreading the message, be careful, look over your shoulder. Again, I agree with you, but I'm just trying to raise the debate here is that then you're feeding the fear and you become the victim before you're even being harassed. I travel the world like ever, I mean, like most of us, not everybody, but most of us, I've always worn watch and jewelry. Yet, I don't wear a Daytona, I don't wear an AP, I don't wear an RM. And I don't think my watch are less valuable either emotionally or financially. So I guess it's a question to you, Jessica, as a woman, also you're more exposed and you've encountered living in New York, some, some occasion, some situation that are not very nice. How do you, did your perception actually drastically changed or you still have some reserve? I mean, so I've lived in a city my entire life and I've, I think it's a testament to how aware and cautious I was. Nothing happened for the first 26 years of my life. So I think that I, I, it shows I was responsible. I never you know, really was too hazardous as to what watch I wore. I was always just an aware person because I was in a city. Going through something like that, your entire sense of security is taken. It doesn't matter what you're wearing. It doesn't matter. You can be as cautious as you want. It's sometimes you're just unlucky. And I think that it shifted my perception of watches. It shifted my perception of social media. It shifted my perception of a lot of things because a passion I had that brought me so much joy was kind of robbed from me, um, really at no co nothing I necessarily did. But I think that I completely agree with you is it's the big four. It's wearing a Serpenti, you're fine. And I mean, if you wanna try and take this off my wrist, congratulations. Go like. <laughs> go go right ahead. So I mean, but I think that it really only is the big four, and that's due to social media. Absolutely. And people also tend to forget that what you're posting is not necessarily what you own. Yeah. That's something that yeah, it's maybe a bold statement, but it's not because we're posting mm -hmm. millions worth of watches that we own just even a single one. Absolutely. I think the other precaution that we should all take is try not to post anything in the time frame. Instantly. Uh, exactly, right? So, I, you know, personally, I, I just would never really post anything about where I'm eating or hanging out with or whatever on the day itself or probably even within that week, and I think it's probably a good precaution to have. Um, okay, one last person I want to ask about this subject is the mayor of Mayfair, W1K. Um, so London, the most affluent neighborhood is W1K. It's the kind of like zip code, right, for Americans. And Shari is the mayor of this. He's not really the mayor, but he really is the mayor. Um, how dangerous is it out there? Because we've had so many friends that we know that have been robbed 
Well, just to get back to your point about AP, PP, and Rolex, I had a friend who got attacked because he was wearing a Vutilainen. So that's quite out there. If you think My lawyer about got it. attacked wearing a Panerai. In, 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 in W1K. I mean, yeah. The, the problem is the thieves are all educating themselves on, like, you know, horror Exactly. Movies. So, <laughs> like, revolution. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, like, it's. Like, do I feel safe? Not necessarily. Not like I used to five years ago. Um, it's changed, and as Dylan very rightly pointed out, you have to keep looking over your shoulder, but then you have to exercise common sense. I think that's basically the bottom line. Um, you know, certain watches will work, and certain watches won't work, and you just have to make that decision. Um, and in most cases, it's 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 the way forward but you know as jessica said in a lot of cases you can get unlucky so um you know so that's the bottom line it's about using common sense okay i would like now like to transition into the uplifting section <laughs> of, this, of this symposium uh andrea uh your italian uh, land of the most handsome and elegant gentleman collectors like Huge the incredible aura montanari that's there at there sandra Bertini. <laughs> Who, for you, was the person that inspired you the most to embark on this journey? Okay, so thank you. I think that's a huge responsibility, uh, and I don't think I fit in the role, but anyhow, it's a, it's nice to, to represent it. Um, it. What you say is true. Uh, we really are used to beauty. We really are used to try to embody it uh, as much as we can. Uh, and we're lucky to have uh, people like Auro who share their passion, share the, the, the aesthetic, share the taste. Um, I would say that we have uh, so many icons in terms of style. Uh, there are so many, not even to, to, to mention. In terms of watches, uh, the best part of it, and of being in Italy in the end, is that you go to Mercante in Fiera in Parma, which for us is uh, the, 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 the fair, and also where you also can buy and sell watches, uh, generally speaking. And uh, the best part is that, yes, we know Auro, yes, we know Sandro, and uh, they are, of course, my icons in, in some sort. And But what's most special is that even going around, you can find a lot of people that just have great stories, uh, great personalities. And so I think that's the, the best of luck. And uh, I hope to find even more and not uh, going on one specifically, even though, uh, I mean, they're pretty huge and then and and we all like them, and uh, it's it's an, it's uh, they are also accounts that are pretty influential, and and uh, they're very nice to follow, and very also they create a lot of culture in that sense. The the gentleman like Auro uh, created the culture that we all benefit from. So, uh, Austin Chu, who who's an inspiration to you, sir? In general, or y up to you. You can say way. No, don't, don't please. <laughs> Besides stop. way, because I, uh, if Eleanor, stop. <laughs> uh, um. I mean, I think for, for me, I, I started liking watches when I was three, right? I mean, my grandparents taught me how to tell time when I was living in an apartment with my mom and my grandparents, and my mom bought me a flick flag. And so for me, I, I thank my mom and my grandparents the most in that sense because that flick flag became my safety blanket, wouldn't be able to shower without it on, wouldn't be able to sleep without it on, wouldn't be able to leave the apartment without it on. And that's kind of what sparked my love for watches. And every year from my birthday ever since uh, until I turned 18 and my parents stopped giving me gifts, um, I would always ask for uh, a watch, like whether it was a G-Shock or a Swatch or you know, a Casio. And so for me, that was kind of the biggest single influence. But however, through, uh, through creating Horror Loop, I've met so many incredible people like yourself and everyone sitting on this panel um that you know it just kind of takes this hobby a little bit further and throughout your journey you meet a bunch of people that influence you you influence them and it kind of creates this you know really nice beautiful community that we know as the watch community right but yeah thank you sir jessica i know you collect with your dad right so, so yeah but i mean my first ever watch influence was my father i got into collecting and primarily vintage with him but in terms of to really make a career out of this. Um, I was definitely pushed by the Phillips team in New York, as that was kind of the first people who welcomed me into the fold. But in terms of starting Daily Grail, which I started this past spring, um, William Messino was influential. He is wonderful. And I mean, he was definitely, I think, super, super motivating in doing this and really encouraged that. So for me, it was absolutely him in order to 
William and Phillips were so imperative in making this a career. Amazing. Thank you so much. Shari. Well, I think for me it's slightly different because I got into it much earlier. And, um, and I think what sort of inspired me to get into watches and style and all of that is, uh, for me, it was very much the world of films and cinemas and, you know, um, you know coming from uh, the business of fashion, uh, you know, outfits are very important. And I've come to realize over the years that watches are a very important part of your outfit, especially as a guy, because there's not that much jewelry you can really adorn yourself with. And it becomes, well, I mean, you know what, I mean, even, even I've taken it to a whole different level these days, but uh, it's not really as much uh, available. So watches then become part of the complete look. And, uh, and there I have to say, wait, your magazine had a, had a big part to play in it. Uh, when, when, you, when you came out with the rake, it was fantastic because it basically put together uh, these looks and made watches and part of that, a very important part of that look of an outfit. And that for me is a very important thing. It's about putting together the whole thing, which I really enjoy doing. Um, which is what sort of, yeah, um, you know, brought me into, into this, this point now. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dylan. So growing up in Cyprus doesn't really put into your head um, the most stylish of people. It's people are typically in uh, shorts, flip tops, and then tank tops. Um, but growing up, I, I used to spend hours actually watching YouTube, uh, learning about things. Um, not necessarily anybody in particular, but just <laughs> learning. I mean, from fabrics to cigars to watches. So I was always a passionate person. Um, and I found inspiration through a variety of, of mediums. And I think for me, YouTube was one of the, perhaps one of the most influential mediums for me, um, trying to get into the nitty gritties because I get quite nerdy. So Excellent. Uh, Asher? Um, you know, I think like, like so many here, uh, certainly it was my family, you know, my dad's worn the same watch for 35 years, um, you know, that kind of thing. But um, when I was 16, um, I took my first trip uh, to London um, with my parents, um, with actually with Gabe, because apparently we don't do anything without each other. Um, and um, I, in, in London, in Greenwich, uh, you can go see uh, the Harrison, um, uh, Harrison clocks. And I think that was where it clicked for me that, um, you know, watches, clocks, they, th there is drama, there is storytelling, there is the history of the world tied up in them. And it never, it, I had never thought of that before and I got incredibly obsessed with that. And, um, you know, so as I, as I became more and more and more watch obsessed, the thing that ultimately hooked me was, you know, why this thing exists? What was the story behind it? You know, what is, you know, I'm, I'm much more interested in some ways of like why, you know, Patek and Chapek split than I am about the, you know, the reason that this, that there's a variation between this reference and that one. And that's, that doesn't mean that there's, you know, bad thing, you know, that's bad not to love that. It's just for me, like, that's, that's what gets me and um, ultimately what, what led me to where I am. Amazing. Thank you so much. You know, I, I, Dylan, you're a very effective influencer because right now you're influencing me on the, the wrist swag. I'm like, do I, I need some, like, a lumbra shit on my wrist, you know, and maybe Next a serpente. Next thing you know, he's going to be wearing I, a diamond serpente on uh, the other wrist. I, I kind of feel... Me and Austin are going to be rocking them at, uh, at Dubai Watch Week. Uh, okay, so Eleanor, any uh, last questions before we well, turn it over to the audience? Actually, I do, because if we circle back to everything we discussed from the passion to the education to the influence, and we discuss people now who influence you in so many ways, but we, you've heard the expression of she's the Anna Wintour of, he's the Ralph Lauren of, he's the Waco of being a walking encyclopedia. Now, if you were to follow one single watch account besides yours or Revolutions, obviously. What, which one would it be? Jessica, please. Um, I would say, if I had to follow one, see, what's, what's so hard is I started in vintage, so my passion really started with that, which obviously it would be Goldberger, which that account is Woo! phenomenal. Yes. But from a new standpoint, it would be Bryn Walner, who does Dime Piece, because I think she represents a completely different portion of the industry that regardless of why you like a watch, whether you love it because it's beautiful or you like it because of the movement and you know every single component. 
at the end of the day, you love the watch and you have a passion. And I don't think one is worth more than the other. It's a passion at the end of the day. And I think Bryn's account really showcases and really gets a new audience into watches. I totally agree. And, and I, I just now we just had an idea we should do an Aura Montanari Bryn Walner photo shoot and vi an interview <laughs> where they interview each other. I think that would be, that'd be so dope. All right, uh, please. Uh, Shari, what is Shari. the one account that you would follow? Well, it's, it's very difficult for me because, again, I would say that, I'm, you know, again, you know, I'd be greedy and I just, I wouldn't be able to choose just the one account. Um, the because difficulty I think, of the I exercise. Think, I, just, well, I know you did, but, uh, you know, you're much more clear cut than that. I'm, I'm afraid not because the reason is for me, it's, again, it's, it's got, I mean, there are accounts that I follow which I look for, for style inspiration. There are accounts which I follow. Uh, for news feed, etc., and then uh, there are accounts which I follow for, and they're all very important to me in every aspect. And of course, there are accounts that I follow for watches. And again, in watches, you have those that follow Aura, for instance, because you know it's just a uh, um, yeah, awesome, unbelievable. Those are the words that come to mind when you follow Aura. But then you know you're following Revolution, you're following Hadinki, all of these. They give you a different set of uh, information that you take from. So. It's very difficult to sort of, uh, it's like, I guess, you know, uh, the, s the same question, throwing question back would be that, you know, if, if, I always find it very difficult to answer the question when people ask me, if you were to keep just the one watch, one, which one would you keep? And it's just not going to happen, right? <laughs> I can't do it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Eleanor, no Eleanor what's the one account that you would follow? If I'd be very pompous, I'd say mine, but mine is not interesting, so I wouldn't follow me. But quite frankly, I fucking love watches. Why? And I'm going to tell you why. It's because we, I follow all of you guys for your personality. But when I want to learn quick, efficient, up-to-date information about what's happening in the watch industry, they're really good at it. Okay, let's round table this. Austin, what's the one account you would follow? Again, I'm more mirroring Shari, because I think um, prior. <laughs> Prior to entering the industry, I think that would have been a much easier question to answer. But because I now actually know you guys, that's like saying, hey, if you could only follow one account on Instagram, ignore all your friends, who would you do? Who would you follow? That's, that's a terrible question to I, ask. I know him instantly. Right? My girlfriend's account. Otherwise, she'd kill me. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, see, great answer. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's, it's very different because there's just so many accounts that do different things. There are accounts that make fun of the industry, like Shame on Risk, like, you know. Which ones are the, your favorites? The ones that make fun of the industry? Um, probably Shame on Wrist. Uh, King Flum is funny as well. Classic. NYC Watch Guy, when he used to make memes, uh, I don't know why about, about why he stopped, but that was funny. Um, but there, you know, also oh, Hodonkey. Did you Hodonkey, like? yeah, Hodonkey yes. was funny. I like. I remember your whey perfume. <laughs> Thank you. That meme. Horological that dictionary is good. Well. Yeah, horological dictionary is great too. Um, but yeah, there there are accounts that don't take themselves too seriously. There are accounts that are like super nerd accounts. There are also accounts that are like super, you know, one brand. Um, there are also accounts that, uh, you know, from different places of the world, different perspectives. There are also watch accounts like you know uh, Amandine's account. She's like literally next, next, next generation. And her perspective of watches are completely different to our pers perspective, right? And so it's like, it's very hard to say one account because it depends on why, why you're entering the watch space. If you want to enter the watch space because you want to sell stuff, then you'd probably follow an account that is more up to date with market pricing, that's secondary, all of that. But if you're entering it from a pure passion perspective, you'd probably follow a, an account that is more you know educational rather than commercial and so it just depends it's funny because when we initial uh, initially conceptualized the symposium hodonkey and horological dictionary were going to jo join as well but wearing masks which in retrospect considering the weather is probably a good idea as well um and and who uh horological dictionary got a new job so he's he was busy um, uh, andrea is, uh, okay I, okay one account one one, one account thing is, I would delete Instagram, to be honest, but if you ask me uh, which number would I like to have on my phone, just one, then yes, being a vintage guy and having studied vintage, I would say Auto because it has answers to my question. So I guess like out of four or five people is most popular one, but one, one account is just, uh, I think we all make the industry what it is. I mean, 
for sure not me because it's too much of a statement like this but um it's nice to have different approaches it's nice to have different informations but uh again if it was just one number I, i'm gonna now name auro like uh influencer the duty uh, influencers you know he, he's like the influencer behind the influencers yeah, yes yeah i like <laughs> exactly gentlemen let's finish it off what are going to be the one account that you would follow so I can feel him twitching with anxiety from Australia when I say this, because I don't think he likes a lot of attention, but I will say that he is easily one of the most knowledgeable and passionate independent watch collectors out there. If you don't follow Times Roman AU, which is a small account, I encourage you to do it, because not only is this man one of the most sharp, thoughtful, and passionate watch collectors out there, he also is a leader in finding some of the newest most innovative and creative um, watchmakers and uh, uh, just folks affiliated with the industry. So Times Roman AU, an account where I, I know I will get a grumpy message on WhatsApp as soon as he sees this, but it is something that I highly, highly recommend you check out. Dylan? I would have said Auro, but uh, not to be generic. Um, I am gonna say a controversial one. Um, and there has been some beef, but if you take all that away, and he does go on a tangent, but Horoji Ancian has incredible knowledge about a lot of watches, and you can learn a lot from him. So perhaps him. I, I would like to just clarify that Sam and I have zero beef. Like, we love each other. It's just everyone else built into something okay. more. Well, than there that. you go. Yeah, exactly. And I think he's awesome. But I, I um, think, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of knowledge in a. Yeah. If like uh, like JJ said, depending on yes. you know the reason as to why you want to get into the industry, if you just want like pure education, number one account. Awesome. Um, okay, now we're gonna we're gonna move on to the question. Yes. But what I thought was interesting, I mean, I hope you did. Is oh, that incidentally, if you guys want to know who the wrong wrist is, that's him right there. That's, that's o him, Omar. <laughs> <laughs> hey, shout out Omar. No, but what's interesting is that first nobody actually mentioned a media, even though medias do have. I thought we were talking about individual people. Oh, we're talking about an Instagram account. Of, of people, not of... Oh, okay. oh no, not, no, just an account. But what's interesting is that in the end, there's no one fits all. And the purpose of the exercise is that for you people in the audience, people watching us online, you discovered, I'm sure, accounts and people you've never heard of and you're going to be really excited to know more about. My takeaway was slightly different. If you don't follow um, Aro Montanari, you need to start following him immediately because he's the man behind Disconnect the man. Disconnect from Instagram. Behind the man. Right. Uh, okay, um, guys, we're going to open it up to the floor. We've got time for maybe one or two questions. Does anyone have a question? Yes, sir. Hello, thank you for the for the show. Uh, uh, one of the most uh, common subjects of all the symposium is the, the insecurity uh, in the watch industry. And uh, I'm going in this industry by accident for protect uh, a watch of uh, a legacy watch. And uh, um, I learned a lot uh, about uh, a lot of years for making a solution for all the passionate, uh, a product solution, not an in insurance or uh, advice. And how do you think, uh, do you think the, the product solution, like a, a clasp with a, a security option, is, uh, is great for the, the future? No. Maybe Shari should be the first one to answer that question, being the biggest and first watch collective Do you think there can the be panel? a security device, like a locking clasp, for example, that will be a solution to watch theft and having your arm cut off? Well, I don't see why not. I think, you know, uh, technology has come forward enough um, and there can be something like that. In fact, I, I think I read something about it or saw something where, you know, you don't really put, it's just sort of like a invisible clasp that you put on top of your existing clasp and it just makes it more, nothing can be foolproof, but I don't see why not. I mean, it's, I'm sure there are companies out there, you know, um, who are coming up with innovative ideas to do that. Uh, Austin. Um, I would say that it would probably sound like a good idea initially, but probably end up being even more dangerous. If the thief cannot steal the watch, they will try even harder to steal the watch. They will cut your arm, they will stab you, they will beat you to try to get the watch instead of just simply taking it away. 
I do think your life is worth infinitely more than a watch. And so uh, even though I think the idea sounds good on the surface, in reality, it, it could end up hurting more people unintentionally. JJ, did well, you well, mind you, sorry. One, one thing to point out is that something like that, and, and this is something I've sort of, uh, you know, when you, when you put an alarm in your house and, you know, you have that big flashing light outside, it's actually meant to be more of a deterrent as opposed to actually being that effective, right? So if, you, if your house gets broken into and the thieves are going to go in and bro, bro, break into your house, they'll still do it. But, you know, sometimes they just feel a little bit cautious if they see that big flashing light. So what I'm saying is that it could possibly be something that deters you from trying to snatch the watch from that person's wrist more than anything else. JJ. Aside from not wearing a watch, I think the safest possible route to go about is having it insured because then you know that there's at least some kind of backup and not that you can necessarily think that when the event is happening, if it does, but just knowing it's insured and knowing that there is not the complete financial loss is the best option. I have to say a huge hats off to Audemars Piguet for that insurance program that they instituted for the watch, if it's within two years old, that they're actually covering the entire replacement value of that watch. That's nuts. I mean, it's so incredible. It actually makes me wear that, my, my watches, as a result of that. So I would like to say a huge thank you to AP for that. I'll offer a positive uh, component to this, which uh, I think it's just important to remember, the very first collaboration that uh, I ever made uh, uh, was stolen. And um, it was stolen the day that I received it. Um, granted, I will add, this was entirely my fault. I left it in my car when I was having a beer. Bad idea, don't do that. But the reason why I bring this up is it was stolen, but I got it back. And I got it back because uh, I registered it. Um, it, was, uh, it was a tutor, it was registered with tutor. Um, and um, I had set every possible alert you could set online and I found the thing on eBay years later, and I got it back. So, um, and I've since told tutors that they don't confiscate it from me when it goes back for service, important remember, reminder. But my, what I would just say is, there's nothing I could have done you know, in that moment to stop that, you know, aside from not leaving my watch in the car when drinking, but there's nothing I could have done really to have prevented that. But I could do something after the fact, and I would say, had it been stolen off my wrist, it would have been the same thing. Here, take it, go. You know, these things, sometimes, these things have numbers on them. They have a way occasionally of making their way back. And to your point, there's nothing that's, your life is not worth it. Give it up and then you never know. It's funny how something might end up coming back to you. And you know, it came back with a few dents that make me wonder, what happened? <laughs> and there's something that's kind of, I don't know, interesting about that. Uh, any one last question from our audience? Ciao Fabrizio, come si? <laughs> Anything? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'll try. I know in terms of influencers in other industries, um, less, you know, high barrier price industries, a lot of, you know, success in terms of being an influencer isn't by followers, but it's by, you know, revenue and by conversion. And I think as um, online shopping, grows more, how do you think that affects the watch industry? I know Austin, you've built a business on that, but for those who aren't looking to sell themselves, do you feel that as a threat or do you, you know, see that as an opportunity or how do you guys measure success in that way when there's no true conversion? Right. Andrea, I think you should be the first being the youngest, speaking to a young audience. Thank you, yeah, uh, not really a thread, it's more an opportunity in my, in my eyes, and thank you for the question. Um, to be honest, I, I've been unsure about this for, for long. I haven't taken a single decision about it because, again, uh, well, Italy is also a bit uh, uh, confusing in terms of law about it and, and every aspect uh, and the legal side of it. I think it's a great opportunity. It's a great opportunity also to uh, put out on the market something new, also in terms of maybe things we're not thinking of already. Uh, I think I'll eventually will do it, but uh, I think that with whatever we said in this panel, uh, uh, one thing is clear, to, at least to me, it is that we're all tried our best to be coherent. And so. 
everything is great and everything is an opportunity as long as it's coherent with what we are and what uh, what we're trying to do. So I think that uh, we have just to find the best way. Uh, is in my case, but thank you. Oh, do you want me? You can. Oh, okay. Um, with, I mean, in fashion and stuff, cosmetics, this happens all the time, right? Like conversion, seeing how effective an influencer is in, in terms of marketing. In the watch space, because I think the AOV is so high, the average order value of the watch, it makes it a lot harder for brands or whatever to give commissions or any of that. But there definitely are brands that pay influencers to say XYZ, and I don't think that they I don't think that enough influencers disclose that information, but I do think that moving forward there will be more and more businesses that can actually convert, uh, that can convert to revenue. Um, but they need to be done in more creative ways, I think. I think it needs to be, it will be a little bit different from other industries such as fashion, cosmetics, um, because it's just a little bit different. It's almost similar to jewelry, right? Um, but with jewelry, sometimes margins are even higher, so it also makes it a little bit easier for them to give commission. Um, but yeah. Um, I would just like to add that, you know, with my business, it's built on personal relationships. Um, so whilst we are building an e-commerce store, it's not the primary focus. It's purely about meeting really cool people and bringing them really, really cool products. Um, and being that gap, being the bridge between the two. Um, so it's very personal, and we try to curate experiences for them, give them something that they wouldn't necessarily uh, get if they walked into a, a high street boutique, or get that uh, by transacting online. So we try to do something in a very different way. Um, so for me, it's, uh, it's not relevant. With that, uh, I would like to uh, draw an end to our symposium. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Asher, Dylan, Shari, Jessica, uh, Austin, and Andrea Casaneño. And of course, the wonderful Alan Picciotto. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. I just want to say thank you so much for giving the next generation you're part of the next generation, so. <laughs> um, a voice, because uh, without this, the, we wouldn't be able to, to talk about you know, our passions, and I think it, it's so important to keep on, uh, on bringing this forward. Um, Austin already mentioned Amadine, and it would be so great to have her here, get her perspective on what's going on in the future. You know, it's Eleanor, like, please get us Amadine. Yes, sir. Not sure, though. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eleanor.